Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Jeff Steven, and um, I am here to uh, to help introduce the funding the program that's entitled Funding Opportunity for Kelp Mariculture in Southwest Alaska. And the presenter is Ms. Tamsin Peoples, and she will be here at the podium in a moment. Um, and I'm just going to give a little summary here of the uh, issue. Uh, mar uh, subject. Uh, mariculture is a new industry with the potential to diversify the economy of coastal Alaska. Alaska entrepreneurs uh, who are applying to participate have exploded across the state with new farms being permitted and coming online every year. The Alaska Fisheries Development Foundation, in partnership with the Southwest Alaska Municipal Conference and the um, uh, APICA, the Alaska Aleutian Island uh, Community Development Association is looking for motivated individuals in Southwest Alaska who are eager to start an aquatic farm. With funding from the United States Department of Agriculture, um, uh, Tamsin is able, uh, and APICA is able uh, to offer uh, technical assistance uh, to develop site plans, business plans, and submit new farm applications. So without any further ado, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Tamsin. Welcome. Well, thank you very much everyone for joining me so early in the morning. I greatly appreciate it. I know it's hard and hard to come inside on a beautiful day like today, but I really just wanna give an overview of what the industry is and what this opportunity presents itself as and how I'm able to help move this industry forward as much as possible with this opportunity. Next slide, please. Sure. So there's been a lot of publications that have come out recently, just in the past six months, which just goes to show how much interest there is, not only from the state, but also on the federal level. This is a um, kelp energy products and marine renewable industry for coastal Alaska communities final report that just came out in August. This is a crazy complex technical report that kind of went over my head. I'm not going to lie. I'm a biologist. I don't know much about the process of making biofuel. But from what I gathered from reading this report is that there is a huge potential to use seaweed as biofuel, as we've seen the Department of Energy creating this research site right here in town in Kodiak, but also the potential for doing seaweed and fisheries byproduct material as biofuel. And this report was designed and looked at specifically Southwest Alaska. Um, this is available online through the AFDF website, as well as if you're here in town, you can come down to the booth. I've got hard copies and digital copies of this report. Next slide, please. There was an, also an Alaska seaweed market assessment that came out, again, specifically for Alaska and Alaskan seaweeds. This is a huge amount of research all across the state of what's being done, what could be done, and what the market looks like domestically and internationally for what we can produce here in the state. Next slide, please. And then of course there was the processing locations in Alaska. Again, this is done by the McKinley Group and this was looking at where's gonna be the biggest hub for seaweed. And this was looking at existing infrastructure, existing mariculture, but also talked with industry specialists from around the world to look at the potential for more growth in different areas. And you can see this little chart at the bottom that Kodiak had a lot of plus signs on it. And they looked at a number of metrics. Um, again, we looked all over the state from Unalaska down through Craig and Southeast Alaska. And once again, this report I have available online in hard copy or on a thumb drive. Next slide, please. So what's the difference between harvest and mariculture? People around the world globally have been harvesting seaweed since time immemorial, including the native Alaskans here in this beautiful country and state. Mariculture specifically is growing seaweed specifically for human use. Next slide, please. That could be done on long lines or done on nets. Um, these are the two most common at sea production methods. On the left, we have sugar kelp being grown commercially off the East Coast. And on the right, you may not recognize it, but if you go down to the powerhouse and get your sushi, that's what the seaweed looks like when it comes out of the water. It's grown on nets that are submerged in the intertidal zone that actually require it to be exposed to air during certain times of the day for it to grow. Next slide, please. And you can also grow seaweed commercially on land, which we kind of refer to as onshore mariculture. Blue Evolution, who's doing a lot of the production here in town, they have an operating site down on 
no worries, down in Mexico where they have these huge big raceways or troughs where they bring in fresh seawater and they just bubble the water. And they have this green seaweed called ulva or sea lettuce, which we have here in Alaska. And that just breaks up through fragmentation and continues to grow. So not only do we have the potential to be growing seaweed in our beautiful pristine waters offshore, but also onshore on our beautiful long summer days. Next slide, please. Okay, what's the difference between an algae, a seaweed, and a kelp? I'm guilty, I use all three terms interchangeably. But what it really breaks down to is that algae is a non-flowering, non-vascular photosynthetic organism that lives in the water. What does that mean? All terrestrial plants that we're familiar with, trees, flowers, even grasses, they produce flowers. So if you have allergies, you probably know exactly when that season is, that they produce pollen. Seaweeds and algaes don't produce flowers at all for reproduction. They have a reproductive cycle more similar to ferns or mosses or even mushrooms. And they're photosynthetic, just like terrestrial plants, meaning they use the energy from the sun to produce sugars and starches and to build compounds in their little organism bodies. And they're non-vascular, which is crazy cool. Even these trees and grasses have veins and venules, like we have veins and venules that our blood runs through to transport minerals and waters through our system. Plants have sap, have xylem and phloem to transport that, but these algae plants don't. They do this amazing amount of direct transfusion and diffusion around their entire bodies. And if you think about a seaweed in the water that's being photosynthetic, it might be photosynthetic everywhere on its body. Next slide. So these can be unicellular, um, they can be in freshwater or in seawater. Next slide. And then the seaweeds that we're familiar with are just the really big algae that we can see with our naked eye that grows in the ocean or in a marine environment. And thankfully, they're kind of broken down into three main groups. And for us, it makes it easy because for the most part, you can break them down by color. You have your beautiful green ones, um, your chlorophytas, like this beautiful sea lettuce, that ulva. Next slide. You can have these beautiful red leafy ones in your rhodophyta groups. Next one. And then of course, our big brown, beautiful kelps. And kelps are just the big brown things. That's just a kind of vernacular colloquial term that we have for big brown seaweeds are our kelps. So I'm guilty, I interchange these terms a lot. And you'll often hear me say, and other researchers say, we refer to seaweeds as a plant to make uh, to refer to a single organism because saying organism is a mouthful and plant just rolls off the tongue better. But just remember, they're technically not plants. Next slide. So there are two major species that we're growing commercially here in Southeast Alaska. Uh, we have our ribbon kelp or Olaria on the left and our sugar kelp or Saccharina on the right. And I've had a lot of questions recently as to why we're growing these species. Basic answer is because it's already been done elsewhere and we didn't want to reinvent the wheel to start. We have an idea in how to manipulate and utilize their natural life cycle and these plants get big. So we can produce a lot of biomass easily. And we've already got markets for them both domestically and internationally. Next slide, please. But there's a number of species that are being harvested wild in the state of Alaska currently, um, mainly down in Southeast Alaska, but also some throughout Southwest. We have our palmaria or our dulse, if you're familiar with that. It's just starting to crop up on the intertidal zone right now. So if you're interested, now's the time to go start scoping out the beaches. I know for sure I've seen some growing off on Near Island before. Um, we have our pyropia in the middle there. Again, that's our sushi seaweed. We do have a number of species of this pyropia family here in Southeast Alaska and throughout the state. Um, the native Alaskans down in Southeast harvest it and call it blackweed and that's pyropia abity. It starts coming out in the spring. We have our bull kelp. Of course, barnacle has been harvesting bull kelp wild for a number of years, producing some amazing products with it. And then down in Sitka, there's a group that harvests the rockweed, the fucus, which is if you've ever gone in the intertidal, I know you've stepped on, slipped on, popped, and they make little rock poppers. They dry them and they make a beautiful, crunchy umami snack. Next slide. And the cool thing is there's a number of potentially viable species that we haven't looked at the economic feasibility for yet, but have analogous species being utilized elsewhere in the world. We have our dragon kelp, which if you spent much time on the water, especially farther southwest Alaska, can get absolutely huge. And it's a close relative of this ribbon kelp. 
I spoke with the folks at Barnacle to ask them if they did any experimentation with it. And they said, yeah, they had. They loved the flavor. They tried to make kelp salsa with it, but it turned into kelp jelly because there was so much alginate and agar in it, which is a huge international market and trade. We import lots of that agar already domestically, and we could be sitting on a whole mother load of it right here in Alaska. We also have a type of sargassum, which if you're familiar with Japanese cuisine is the hijiki pickles, which are very common down in the Okinawa area. And then of course our ulva and ulvarias are green sea lettuces, which blue evolution is already growing commercially down in Mexico. Next slide. And then of course, I think a huge jackpot we're sitting on right now is our diverse amount of laminarias or these big thick leathery brown seaweeds. Going again back to Japanese cuisine, if you do any sort of dashi stock or soup base, you're going to be using this kombu, this really thick, um, it looks almost like dried leather when it comes out of the water and is dried on the beaches, but that's what they use for all of the bases of their cooking. And we have a lot of analogous species here throughout the entire state, which are unique to this part of the world. Next slide. So if you want to know more about what we're looking at or what you're looking at next time you go out in the water, Seaweeds of Alaska is your best resource. It's a fantastic website and it also has a print book. I've got a couple copies of that um, down at the booth if you wanna come um, look through it. But it again, breaks it down by color. You got your greens, your reds, your browns, and then you just kind of go through there and see what's available. You'll have the common name, the scientific name, where it grows, what it looks like. So if you're looking at something and don't know what it is or want to go find something, this is the most comprehensive, easy to use resource we have right now in the entire state. Next slide. So how does this whole kelp mariculture process work? Really, we're tied into the natural life cycle of these big brown seaweeds. Next slide, please. And it starts out with a big plant, a parent plant that just grows in the wild. At certain times of the year, usually in late summer, um, early fall, that plant becomes fertile and produces either a sori or a sporophyll, depending on the plant. And then that sori or sporophyll release spores. Next slide. Those spores actually swim in the water. So think about these tiny microscopic spores being released to swim free into the ocean. They have very little control of where they're going, how far they're swimming, but they'll swim around anywhere for a couple hours, maybe even a couple days. And thinking about our currents, how far those spores can be dispersed by just the natural movement of the water. Eventually they settle and germinate. Next slide. And those produce tiny microscopic gametophytes, which are only a few cells long. So we cannot see them with a the naked eye. They could be out there on the rocks and you would have no idea unless you took a scraping and looked at them under the microscope. And they'll produce both male and female gametophytes. Next slide. Which eventually will mature. And then that male gametophyte releases sperm. So again, at the mercy of the ocean, it's releasing this tiny swimming sperm that has to go and find its female counterpart through chemosensory ability. So it's actually going using a sense of smell to find the female. And then it's fertilized, next slide. It produces an egg that gets fertilized, next slide. That grows into a teeny tiny little kelp baby that is only a few cells long, next slide. Continues to grow into a juvenile. And then next slide, eventually grows into that big, beautiful six to 10 foot long plant that we want. Next slide. So the first process of going through this whole thing is going out and finding those fertile parent plants. And thankfully, it's really easy. Next slide. Because it's very visually obvious when a plant is fertile. It looks like someone has taken Nutella and spread it all over the nice clear blades. Um, so the picture on the left is what bulk kelp looks like. So next time you go out in the summer and look at those big, long blades, or leafy parts of the bulk kelp, you'll start to see sections that look like someone has spread Nutella on them. And the cool thing about bull kelp is those sections naturally will peel out like a sticker and then drop down to the bottom and help the spore disperse the spores even further. So we go out there, we're looking around. It's great if you have friends to so just go poke around the intertidal zone, find your fertile plants. And then we have to collect 50 fertile parent plants from within 50 kilometers by water of where you want your farm to be. And that's a fishing game regulation that we're working on. They're willing to play ball. We just have to do a little bit more research on it. And then next slide, we take those fertile sections back to the lab or to the hatchery and get them to release their spores. 
We do that by stressing them out. We make them think, hey, it's winter. This is your last time to create offspring. You better release all your spores all at once. So we dry them and we put them in the dark. Then we put them back in seawater and all of their spores go a swimming. Then we take, next slide, PVC pipes wrapped with a special type of twine. You want something that the little spores are gonna want to settle on and they will settle on everything. As you well know, they'll settle on the bottom of your boat, the bottom of a dock, that rock over there, maybe the shell of a crab, but we want those spores to settle on that string. So we put this pipe and string in seawater, add those swimming spores into there and put them into the dark to get the spores to stop swimming and settle and stick to things. And then starts the incubation process. Next slide. So we incubate them in the hatchery, just like you have a nursery for your plants before you have your little seedlings that you outplant into your garden. So over about a two month period, we're going from that microscopic single spore to gametophytes to these itty bitty baby blades. Next slide. And we want blades that are about one to two millimeters in long before we put them out in the ocean. That's teeny, teeny, tiny. But again, if we let those pipes sit in the hatchery, they'll just continue to grow. And once they get too big, they don't really outplant or transfer as well because they kind of fall off a little easier the bigger they get, which seems a little counterintuitive but those little anchoring systems can get ripped off apart if they're spread between multiple sections of string. Next slide. So if we leave them in the hatchery, they'll just go bonkers and continue to grow exponentially. And then it's time to outplant. So once those plants reach that two millimeter size, we transport those pipes to the farm. And we can transport these pipes across the state. I've shipped pipes from Kodiak to Ketchikan over a three day period and still had great success. For being tiny little two millimeter plants, they are extremely resilient. So they can take a beating because remember, they're intertidal plants. They're used to taking a beating all winter long. Think about the winter that we had this year alone here in Alaska. Cold, dry, exposed to low tide, crazy water, crazy snow. So they're pretty hardy little dudes. And a farm is a pretty easy setup. It can have any sort of anchorage, any dimensions. I've seen long skinny lines with two very long, long lines. But for the most part, people are doing a kind of more square or rectangular um, aspect ratio farm. And again, any poundage of anchorage, any ropes. We've had people use crab pots as anchors, use um, buoys they got from um, recycled or upcycled from beach wash, reusing sane line. Um, I've talked with some of the farmers that say they prefer using spent line or our older line because it has a little bit more grit to it and it holds uh, the, the kelp a little bit better. And it can be, again, any sort of design, but the biggest thing we want to be able to do is hold that seaweed at about six feet under the surface all winter long. So think about the tidal swings that we have here. How do you maintain that depth? Is it tension? Is it anchorage? Is it buoyancy? There's a lot of development that's happening right now on the farm engineering side because Alaska is very unique as anyone who spent time here knows it's very different from anywhere else in the world, which means we're going to have very different farm designs than anywhere else in the world. So every year these farms are developing and changing and adapting to the new challenges that we're facing every season as the farms continue to grow and expand. Next slide please. So we outplant these guys by threading those long lines or those ropes through the pipe attaching those lines to the frame of the farm. And we take that string that the little baby seaweeds are growing on, attach it to the rope and hold that pipe and run down the length of that rope. And that string is being unwound around that rope. So as those little baby seedlings are growing, you know, it'll be a couple of centimeters by June. We're out planting maybe October through December. Next slide. Um, by February, you've got stuff that's about a foot. Next slide. And then again, by harvest time in May, we've got plants that are about six feet long, if not longer. It's a very short, very fast growing season. Next slide. And then it's time for harvest. And right now there's a bunch of different technologies being adapted, whether it's going by hand, by via mechanization, but long story short, what you're doing is you're cutting off the plant, putting it into fish totes or brailler bags and transporting it to your processor. And a processing manual just came out um, this past January to show about what are the processing handling guidelines? How long can you keep the kelp out of the water before it starts to lose its market value? Um, how much stuff can you pack into a single tote before it starts to go anaerobic? 
And then processing is a whole another unique challenge that we're facing in Alaska too. Again, the species that we're working with have already been utilized and grown on the East Coast as well as elsewhere in the world via mariculture or wild harvest. And right now everyone's doing food because it's the biggest bang for your buck. This is ribbon kelp per, um, processed three different ways. On the right, we have that raw, beautiful, deep, rich brown in the middle is dried and on the right is blanched. You take that brown seaweed, you put it in hot water for even just a few seconds and it gets this brilliant emerald color. Next slide. And drying has been around since time immemorial as being a way to process your seaweed. On the left is the blackweed being dried out in sheets in the sunshine down in Southeast Alaska. We don't really get sunshine a lot. So a lot of these sheets end up being spread out on living room floors in the spring to dry that blackweed. But on the right, that's kombu being processed commercially in Japan. That's just laid on a gravel bed and laid flat or hung under a shelter with basically clothespins. Kombu in Japan has an extremely high market value because it's an artisanal market. I was on a ski trip in Hokkaido, the North Island where lots of this mariculture and wild harvest happens for kombu. And we're in the interior of the island skiing, but you'd go to the resort gift shops and they would have kombu as a souvenir that you're supposed to bring home because you went to the North Island, that's what you do. When you go to Alaska, you bring home seafood. When you go to Hokkaido, you bring home kelp. Next slide. And then there's a number of other ways to make the product shelf stable for food. Um, there's pickling as barnacles done with their bull kelp um, pickles, which if you haven't tried their curry one is my favorite. Um, the seaweed salad that you get at the powerhouse, you probably get that in bags that have already been cut, blanched, seasoned, and then frozen. And then there's also salt packing that's been done with seaweeds in Southeast Asia. If you're familiar with the row on kelp industry that used to be a pretty big industry throughout the state, that was all done through salt packing. And then recently, Sea Grant and Taco Loco came together to make a kelp tortilla. So there's a number of different ways we can incorporate this product into existing markets as well. It sounds kind of funky, but if you've ever had a spinach tortilla, pretty much the same thing. It had a nice umami flavor. There wasn't much of a texture difference, but it definitely brought your quesadilla up a little bit in level. Again, that seaweed processing and handling guidelines just came out, um, which talked about, again, the methodology, the timeline, what's been done so far. And again, everything has been food-based processing. Here in town, Blue Evolution um, pairs with Wild Source to process all of their kelp. And they're doing some pretty large bags. I think the last couple of years have been five or 10 pound bags that they then blanch, um, vacuum seal, freeze, and then ship down south. And again, this, this is again left open for, I've got hard copies and digital copies at the booth and available on the AFDF website. And then coming up recently, or in the next couple of weeks actually, about a month out is going to be a handling processing workshop here in town. So that booked out really quickly. I think they had over 120 applicants. So, which means I suspect they'll be doing another one very near in the future. So where to start? I've just thrown a whole bunch of information, not only about seaweeds, but the process and the industry. But say you are super jazzed on wanting to get in on this and you wanna start now. Well, there's a couple big questions to ask yourself. Next slide. First off, do you wanna do mariculture or do you wanna do harvest? or maybe both. The application process is pretty daunting and it takes about a year, maybe two years from start to finish to get that application through. And then what? You just start growing seaweed? Do you have a buyer? Are you making your own product? What's the process gonna be? So I've been encouraging folks to do um, a little bit of both. Do a small scale commercial harvest to develop your product. And then when the mariculture starts, you'll have that processing down. Under what's called a commissioner's permit through the state of Alaska, commercial seaweed harvest is still allowed on a very well-managed and sustainable way. Barnacle, for example, which has grown very rapidly in the past five, six years alone, they're still only doing wild harvest, mainly because no one's growing bull kelp yet. But that means that it is a sustainable way to do it. They're very ecologically minded and sustainability minded folks, but they figured out how to create amazing range of products off wild kelp so that when someone is available to finally grow bulk kelp for them, they've already got the processing system down. Next slide. Oop, but you wanna grow some kelp. Cool, I am all for it. We have a lot of resources available and I think a lot of folks that I've spoken with 
across the state, people who are most interested in becoming kelp farmers are our commercial fishermen because it works so brilliantly off schedule of the salmon season. And fishermen are a fantastic resource to work with because they have the knowledge. They've been on the water forever. They know what it takes to actually put gear in and out of the water and how much work it's gonna to take to get something done. Next slide. And just like any sort of terrestrial project, it's all about location, location, location. We've got hundreds and thousands and thousands of miles of perfectly viable waterways and coastlines in Alaska. But where do you put it that makes the most sense? You need to think about your distance from your processor. You need to think about how often you're gonna be able to get out to your site throughout the winter. Because as we've seen, you can have some pretty substantial weather. You don't want your anchors to drag. You don't want something getting blown into your farm. Can I have a click? Yeah, so can you get there throughout the entire growing season? Think about all the nasty blows. I'm not asking you to go out there and check on your farm during the blow, but after, can you get out there in a weather window? Um, how far do you have to transport that kelp to the nearest processor? Is it a 14 hour run? Is it a four hour run? Is it a four day run by boat? And we, again, because of the a fishing game requirement, we have to have access to wild kelp beds within that 50 kilometers by water of where you wanna put your farm. And this has impacted certain farms availability or ability to grow certain species. For example, I worked with a farmer down in, in the Ketchikan area and he wanted to grow sugar kelp. We couldn't find sugar kelp within 50 kilometers by water. So we had to grow something else. And then again, think about your weather patterns. Do you have a nice, big, beautiful beach, but then a whole bunch of driftwood that gets blown up onto that beach all winter? You put a farm there, that means that driftwood's gonna get blown through your farm throughout the season. Is there vessel traffic that goes through there? Because people are gonna be running their boats at high speed. They're not used to seeing buoys in the water and getting a prop fouled in your gear can be a pretty detrimental process. And as anyone who does any sort of business in Alaska, there are a number of challenges. It's a new industry. I've mentioned a couple of times, so every year has been different. Farms are constantly being adapted and advanced throughout the seasons. And it's expensive because, well, doing anything here is expensive. The nice thing is there's a way to recycle gear, talk with local farmers who are already doing a lot of the work, who have a lot of experience, and who are open to chatting with people and not having everybody reinvent the wheel over and over and over again. And then this is a fantastic opportunity for Alaskans. It's called the Mariculture Revolving Loan Fund, which gives you up to a $100,000 grant, I think, or $100,000 loan per, is a certain volume and um, you have to have a certain, again, capital put against it. But this is through the state of Alaska. It's a fixed rate, which means it's not gonna change over time. And you don't have to pay it off the first year. They have up to 10 years before you have to start putting any payment against it because some of these mariculture industries like gooey duck might take five or seven years of growth before you produce anything of market availability. And recently, um, the governor's budget just came out and he wants to add another $25 million to this revolving loan fund. So they have this whole support behind it. And not only is this available just to farmers, but also to hatcheries because that's gonna be another big kind of hurdle that we're coming up to is hatchery capacity within the state. Next slide. Um, this is another funding opportunity that's just about to wrap up. So folks who are interested, I highly encourage you to take a look at this. This is the USDA Climate Smart Commodities Opportunity. This is free money. This is a non-matched fund. Normally with these big funds that come out of these federal agencies, you have to provide a certain dollar value to match them. Usually it's about 50-50 or 60-40. They're not asking for a match. They literally want to see a project or a commodity that's climate smart, carbon neutral, or carbon negative. And hey, guess what seaweed does? Sucks carbon out of the ocean. So this is a really cool product uh, or opportunity that's come up. It's closing, I think, April 8th. So there's not a whole lot of time. It's a pretty hefty application, but think about the off pay, you know, maybe four or eight hours of your work to get this nasty application for the chance of hundreds of millions of dollars of basically free money. It's a great opportunity. And I've got more information about this at the AFDF website and down at the booth. Oh yeah, and then you can see the funding. I mean, we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars of opportunity here. And then I come into the picture with the Spawning Mariculture and Southwest Alaska grant. 
that's what's brought me up here today, not only just to spread the good word of kelp, but I'm actively looking for farmers who want to get an application in. The application period is only open January 1st through April 30th of every year. But hey, even if we don't finish the application by the April 30th deadline, you'll have it in your hands and done. So January 1st, 2023, you can click submit. And I will help walk through the entire process from site selection, farm design, or put you in touch with engineers who can actually build you a farm in a box and the application process. It's a pretty detail specific application process. I've navigated it a number of times. It doesn't get any easier, but I can do all the hard lifting for folks. And hopefully, you know, with a couple coordinates and a couple good discussions, I can get most of it done for you. So it'd be a huge amount of pressure off the farmer themselves. So yeah, charts and diagrams. They want very specific things. They're very nitpicky. If your, your farm doesn't point or your charts don't point exactly north to south, they will send it back to you and demand a new one. Um, farm siting and all of that information, again, I'm here to hold the hand and give you guidance and walk you all the way through it. So if you're living in Southwest Alaska, which yay, we're in Kodiak, it's great. Or if you work with a community that wants to get into this too, I'm here to provide the assistance and guidance and coaching to get through the application process. So you literally have something you can click submit and send to the state. Are there any questions? I know I've given you a whole bunch of information. I'm happy to field some questions now. And if we do run out of time, I'll be down at the booth all day today. So are there any questions from the audience here? I'll start off with a quick question. I know there's been a, a lot of uh, uh, research with algae into uh, biofuels, especially yes. about six or seven years ago from the airlines. Uh, and I'm wondering, are there enough lipids, I guess, in, in kelp to, to pursue something like that? Or is this really marketed mostly for human consumption? There's definitely the technology has been there to make fuel from seaweed since about the 60s and 70s. The Navy was looking at it back then to see if we could power submarines off of it instead of having nuclear reactors on boards. So we've been able to make viable biofuel from seaweed for decades. The big thing right now is getting that price point down. Can we produce enough seaweed where we can actually make it feasible financially? And it's very similar from my understanding. Again, I'm a biologist, not a chemist, but it's a very similar process to producing like biofuels using um, any sort of other metabolism process. That's why comparing it with like the fish waste, which has an extreme amount of lipids, could be the perfect hybrid. And a lot of Southwest communities that do a lot of processing have a lot of fish waste. Thank you. Of course. If you're interested, I highly recommend you take a copy of that um, report. It's pretty in depth and a lot of it went over my head, but they've got some nice synopses in there. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'd be interested to know, uh, it might be kind of early uh, in, in, in the business world, but are, are you seeing uh, increase in private investors in either farms or processors? Uh, and I imagine the outlook is looking pretty good for people who want to financially support companies that don't have the financial uh, backing. Right. Yeah. There's been a lot of um, conservation groups that have put in a lot of momentum and funding into this. Um, we've got the, a lot of folks down in the Prince William Sound working with the Native Conservancy as well. There's a lot of, there's kind of at this point, mostly private business like Blue Evolution and Seagrove down in Southeast Alaska, and then some nonprofit groups. Thankfully, everything just seems to be pretty small scale and people still want to have the independent farmer, like we have the independent fishermen here. Um, they, no one really seems to be interested or there's not a lot of momentum behind sharecropping yet. That's not to say that it might not happen. Um, we've seen some of the processors apply for sites here in town and in Sandpoint. But even the um, awarded applicants haven't done anything yet with the site. Uh, there's kind of this horse and cart, chicken and egging thing going on right now between processing and, and product availability. A lot of these big international groups that want to do bioplastics and biofuel made a substantial volume of seaweed. And these farmers, you know, as we develop these technologies with farms and engineering, there's a certain amount of growing pains as you go up, you know, no one really wants to go in 100%, 100 acre plus in the single first season, because you don't know if that site's going to work, if your technology works. But a lot of these bigger international operations really won't even look our way until we can guarantee hundreds of thousands of tons a year. 
So what comes first? And I think we have to simultaneously create the horse and cart at the same time, but there's a, someone's got to pull that trigger. And there's some groups coming online that I'm working with and talking to that are eagerly and excitedly going in for over hundred acres off the bat. So there's growth happening rapidly. Well, thank you so much, folks. Come see me at the booth. Happy to distribute information and answer any more questions. Thank you again. That was great.